On behalf of the Patient Safety Authority, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar titled, Ask an Infection Preventionist. My name is Joanne Atkins, and I'll be your moderator for this program. Now I'd like to introduce the speakers for the webinar. Terry Lee Roberts and I, Joanne Atkins, are both registered nurses and senior infection preventionists for the Pennsylvania Patient Safety Authority. In these roles, we assist with the improvement of patient safety by initiating, developing, implementing, and monitoring new and existing infection prevention initiatives throughout the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. In addition, we provide educational programs on infection prevention and control topics for acute care facilities, ambulatory surgery centers, long-term care facilities, and risk management and quality groups. We both have extensive backgrounds in critical care nursing, infection prevention and control, and emergency preparedness. Terry Lee and I have presented educational programs on infection prevention topics at the local, state, and national levels. Terry Lee, I will now turn the program over to you. Thank you, Joanne. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. Joanne and I know that you're all very busy and are probably planning to call in for the weekly COVID-19 statewide post-acute care providers call at one o'clock. We will do our very best to get you off in time so you can call in for that. Joanne and I want you to know that we stand united in doing our part to help you protect your staff and your residents. We count our blessings. No one knows what the next days, weeks, or months will bring, but during this time of uncertainty, Joanne and I celebrate you as our infection prevention heroes. We look forward to brighter days ahead because together we will win this war against COVID-19. So the call that I just spoke of, I know there's a lot of information going out to you from many different entities, uh, and I know you're not getting all of them. So in case you don't have this information, again, these slides are available. These are um, the statewide calls for COVID-19. For you on Mondays, they're for all healthcare providers, and on Tuesdays, they're for post-acute care providers. You can use either number to dial in, and the meeting ID number is the same for both. So you may wanna put those on your calendars if you haven't um, gotten that already. We put together some um, important links for the COVID-19 resources. The first ones are the um, HON alert, Health Alert Network HON is the CDC's and Pennsylvania Department of Health's primary way of sharing information about urgent public health incidents. If you're not already signed up to receive the HON alerts, please sign up now. Then under the infection prevention resources for the CDC resources, the second link takes you to the list of the guidance documents that are now all in one place. Before, you, when you went on the CDC website, you had to jump all over to find all of the guidance documents. They now have them all nicely together in one place. And again, if you pick on that second link for the CDC resources, it will take you right to those. Uh, the last link, if you have a supply chain issue and need a substitute disinfectant, this is the EPA link for disinfectant use against SARS-CoV-2, what we know as COVID-19. So we wanted to make sure that you had those. This slide has Pennsylvania's regional healthcare coalitions. As you can see, they're divided by region. Um, each region has listed there who their contact is with their contact information. If you haven't already joined, you are welcome to join. The regional healthcare coalitions, you will hear them called HCCs, will provide you with up-to-date information and guidance, and they will assist you when you have supply issues. Okay, so moving on from COVID-19, for the reason that we were having the questions and answers for today, these are some of the questions, or I should say all of the questions that you've forwarded to us that we have to answer for you. So question number one, what are the differences between social distancing, quarantine, and isolation? Social distancing, or some people prefer to call it physical distancing, 
is a public health practice that aims to prevent sick people from coming in close contact with healthy people in order to reduce opportunities for disease transmission. It can include large scale measures like canceling group events or closing public spaces, as well as individual decisions such as avoiding crowds. Quarantine separates and restricts the movement of people who were exposed to a contagious disease to see if they become sick. And isolation, as you know, is separating sick and infectious people from the well to prevent transmission of the illness for the duration of the illness. So what type of isolation is required from COVID-19, airborne contact or droplet contact? The isolation required for COVID-19 is a combination of standard precautions and transmission-based precautions. It doesn't nicely fit into any of the transmission-based precautions that we currently have. You need to have either a respiratory mask, a respirator mask, or a PAPR to use if available. If none is available, a surgical mask is appropriate. Remember, we are at war and that means we use what we have. So again, surgical masks are appropriate for this. You also need contact precautions, meaning you need to wear a glove and gown. Those are required. Eye protection. You can either use goggles or face shields. That is required. And consider eyeglasses do not provide the needed protection, so that does not count as your eye protection. If you need to wear your eyeglasses, wear your eyeglasses, and then just put a face shield over top. So how do you clean, disinfect, or sterilize a mask? There's a lot of information um, about this in the media now. So for right now, CDC does not recommend the use of respirators, I'm sorry, they don't recommend the reuse of respirators as a standard of care, but said that its practice should be considered when shortages occur. We know there are shortages. So the CDC has identified three decontamination methods as uh, most promising based on the limited data that they have available to them. Those three methods include ultraviolet germicidal uh, irradiation, vaporous hydrogen peroxide, and moist heat. They're also considering steam treatment and liquid hydrogen peroxide as other promising methods, although some limitations exist with those methods. So while we don't have them in place now, look for something like that um, to be put in place soon. And now the $64,000 question. My staff has asked about homemade masks. Will these masks protect them? So in the healthcare setting, improvised or homemade masks do not provide any protection as PPE and should not be worn by any healthcare professional unless there are absolutely no masks or other respiratory protection left. Remember, I told you, sign up for your HCC. If you do not have the PPE that you need, you can contact your HCC representative and they can assist you. So let me get back to wearing a cloth mask. It may provide false reassurance as protection in the healthcare setting. Cloth masks are the very last option in the CDC's recommendations are, and are intended for a facility that does not have any face masks available and cannot get any more and should only be utilized after all, protect, all other options provided by the CDC have been exhausted. On March 24th, the American Nurses Association, the ANA, released a position statement saying that evidence does not support the notion that cloth masks are safe for healthcare personnel providing care to patients with coronavirus, as they do not afford the wearer any significant protection. Now that was for the healthcare setting. Outside of the healthcare setting, we know that on April 3rd, Governor Wolf advised all Pennsylvanians to wear cloth masks when out in public. We've asked the public to please save surgical masks and N95 respirators for our healthcare workers and first responders. Cloth masks may limit the number of respiratory droplets admitted by the person wearing the mask. 
Epidemiologists believe that infected people can spread the virus when they are either asymptomatic or presymptomatic. So we wanna bolster the reverse isolation concept. Consider what you've already heard. My mask protects you and your mask protects me. For instructions on how to make a homemade mask, you can visit health.pa.gov for instructions. Again, that's health.pa.gov for those instructions. So do we have to do anything special with meal trays of residents suspected or confirmed to have COVID-19? The answer is no. All trays are, con are contaminated with biohazard. For example, you have residents that have C. diff, maybe influenza, MRSA, CRE, et cetera. Staff need to follow the same processes they do for these trays, meaning the trays should not be left to sit around, wear gloves when handling trays, followed by careful hand hygiene when the gloves are removed. Disposable trays, dishes, and utensils are not required. The combination of heat, time, detergent, et cetera, removes the pathogens from the dishes. So a helpful tip might be to remind your staff that COVID-19 is a coronavirus. The common cold is a coronavirus. So the transmission route is the same as it is for the common cold. So I'm gonna take this one step further and mention environmental cleaning. So for environmental cleaning, it's more important now than ever, you wanna dedicate resident equipment when possible. If you can't do that and you need to use shared equipment, make sure you follow the manufacturer's instructions for use on non-disposable equipment on how you need to clean that equipment. And now more than ever, you need to complete audits on cleaning and disinfecting to make sure that the right thing's being done. And you wanna use routine procedures for laundry, utensils, and medical waste. You don't need to do anything special now just because we have COVID-19. So another question that we had, the family does the residence laundry and can this still be done safely? It's a really good question and it's one that um, the Pennsylvania Department of Health is currently looking at, but for right now, the answer is yes. Uh, the recommended process is a staff member would collect and bag the resident's laundry and the family would pick the laundry up at the door of your facility without entering the facility. The family then returns the fresh laundry and drops it off to the staff member at the door, again, without entering the facility. And when doing laundry at this point in time, we would wanna consider washing on the highest temperature that the clothing will permit and drying again on the highest temperature that the clothing would permit. So how long does COVID-19 survive on surfaces? We've heard a lot of numbers thrown around about that. A New England Journal of Medicine study shows that infectious SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 virus can survive for up to 72 hours on plastic and steel and up to 24 hours on cardboard. Again, this is why environmental cleaning is so important. And at this time, please make sure you take the time to especially thank your EVS workers, not just for coming to work, but for doing the work that they're doing. And do I need to wash my hands after I wear gloves to perform resident care? Yes. Bacteria can pass through tiny invisible holes in gloves, and because your hands can become contaminated when you're removing your gloves, you must remove your gloves and then wash your hands or use alcohol hand gel after resident contact. Please make sure that your um, healthcare workers are not reusing gloves in between residents, because this can transmit germs from one resident to another, and it's an, a good time to point out, to remind your staff to not to clean their gloves with an alcohol-based alcohol hand rub that will just break down the integrity of the gloves. I've seen um, some um, certified nurses assistants being 
thinking that they're being fiscally responsible by reusing gloves and just cleaning with alcohol in between, um, that's not an okay practice and you need to pay attention, look for that and remind them that um, they can't do that. So at this point in time, um, I'm gonna need to hop off of this call. I'm gonna turn um, the rest of the presentation over to um, Joanne Atkins. So Joanne. Thank you, Terry Lee. Okay, Karen or thank you. Now we had other questions that came in besides the questions on COVID-19. So these are other questions that facilities were concerned about. If blood glucose meters are dedicated for single resident use, do they need routine cleaning and disinfection? And if so, how often? Infectious agents such as hepatitis B can be transmitted through indirect contact transmission even in the absence of visible blood that can be seen. What indirect contact transmission is, it's the transfer of an infectious agent. And a lot of times when we're speaking bloodborne pathogens, we're talking about hepatitis B or C or HIV from one resident to another through a contaminated object, such as your blood glucose meter, or by a person, usually the hands of a healthcare worker. If blood is transferred to the meter and that meter is not disinfected after use, transmission can occur. The healthcare worker can contaminate their hands with the blood, which is transferred to the meter, and then that blood on the meter can be transferred to another resident or to the healthcare work hands of another healthcare worker. Contamination also can occur if personnel do not change their gloves and perform hand hygiene between residents. There was a large study done of blood glucose meters and found that at least 30% were contaminated with blood. And the most common site of contamination was at the test strip insertion site and on the outside surface of the meter. And as we, you know, Hepatitis B can remain infectious in dried blood on environmental surfaces for at least seven days. This is why blood glucose meters, whether they are dedicated to a single resident or not, must be cleaned after each use. If they are dedicated for single resident use, then they're cleaned and disinfected according to manufacturer's instructions, but be very careful to store them in a location to prevent inadvertent use on the wrong resident. And as always, you need to remind your healthcare workers they must remove gloves and perform hand hygiene after each use and after cleaning and disinfecting the meter. Why do I have to gown up when I enter a contact precaution room if I'm just observing and do not intend to touch the resident or patient? This goes back to studies that were done and all of the studies came to the consensus that greater than 90% of the time when a healthcare worker enters the room, they touch either the resident or objects in the room. And it is due to unexpected issues that arise once they're in the room. How many times have you walked in a room just to quickly look at something and your resident needs their pillow adjusted, they need their tray pulled closer, and all of those things put you at risk of picking up pathogens. Because of that, PPE should be worn regardless of whether you think you will have contact with the resident or its environment or not. Why is eye protection a part of droplet precautions? One look at this picture explains why you must protect your eyes. The average sneeze releases millions of droplets and each one of those droplets can contain pathogen. Infections can be introduced through the mucous membranes of the eye, including viruses and bacteria, such as herpes, Staph aureus, COVID-19, hepatitis B and C, or HIV. These pathogens are introduced to the eye either directly from respiratory droplets or blood splashes, or from touching your eyes with contaminated fingers or objects. 
And one of those objects are contacts. During this pandemic, encourage your staff to not wear their contacts because people who wear contacts tend to touch their face more often. Why aren't enhanced barrier precautions the same as standard precautions? And they are not, there are some differences. All residents are in standard precautions at all times, but as part of standard precautions, the use of personal protective equipment or PPE is based on anticipated exposure to blood, body fluids, secretions, or excretions. Enhanced barrier precautions expand the use of PPE beyond blood and body fluid exposures. It is recommendations to use PPE for high contact resident care activities that have been demonstrated to result in transfer of multidrug resistant organisms to gowns and gloves of healthcare workers, even if blood or other body fluid exposure is not anticipated. How are enhanced barrier precautions different from contact precautions? Contact precautions require the use of gown and gloves on every entry into the residence room, regardless of the level of care being provided. The resident is given dedicated equipment and is placed into a private room if available. When private rooms are not available, then we can cohort residents or place residents with the same pathogen together. Residents on contact precautions should be restricted to their rooms, except for medically necessary care and restricted from participation in group activities. Because of these restrictions, placement in contact precautions is intended to be time limited. Enhanced barrier precautions, on the other hand, gloves and gowns are recommended when performing high contact resident care activities. The residents are not restricted to the rooms and do not require placement in a private room. Because enhanced barrier precautions do not impose the same activity and room placement restrictions as contact precautions, they are intended to be a longer term approach to managing the residents that are colonized with targeted pathogens. If a resident is on contact precautions for a novel or targeted multi-drug resistant organism, do I still need to put other residents on the same unit on enhanced barrier precautions? And yet the answer is yes. Even if the resident colonized with a novel or targeted multi-drug resistant organism is placed on contact precautions, Enhanced barrier precautions are recommended for other at-risk residents on that unit, such as those residents with indwelling medical devices like a PICC line or wounds. Next slide, please. Are enhanced barrier precautions recommended for MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, C. difficile, or scabies? Currently, the CDC guidance on the use of enhanced barrier precautions is focused on preventing the spread of novel or targeted multidrug resistant organisms. And those organisms are defined as pan resistant organisms, Candida aureus, and the carbapenemase producing organisms, the Pseudomonas, the Escenetobacter, and the Enterobacteriaceae. Facilities, however, may choose to apply enhanced barrier precautions for residents infected or colonized with other epidemiologically important multidrug resistant organisms based on your facility policy. Enhanced barrier precautions does not replace the existing guidance regarding the use of contact precautions for other pathogens such as C. diff, neurovirus, or scabies and conditions in nursing homes. I'm going to refer you and request that you keep the CDC disease key close. That is Appendix A of the infections and conditions that's part of the CDC guidelines for isolation precautions. 
It is a list of infections and other conditions and tells you what precautions are required for each of those infections or organisms. Do residents placed on enhanced barrier precautions require placement in a single room? And the answer is no. Single person rooms, if available, should be prioritized for residents placed on contact precautions, such as residents with acute diarrhea, draining wounds, wounds, or other sites of secretions that you cannot cover or contain. Residents on enhanced barrier precautions may share rooms with other residents. However, your facility that has the capacity to offer single person rooms may choose to do so. Oh, you missed one. There we go. Are gowns and gloves the only personal protective equipment needed for enhanced barrier precautions? And the answer to that is not necessarily. We always have to remember that when residents are placed in transmission-based precautions or enhanced barrier precautions, they are also still in standard precautions. Gloves and gowns are the minimal level of PPE required for enhanced barrier precaution activities, but because of all residents being in standard precautions at all times, you may need additional PPE depending on the job you're about to do. For example, if your uh, wound irrigation is going to be done or you have a resident with trach and you're going to do tracheostomy care, then you would want to do face protection and eye protection because there's a chance there may be splashes or sprays. When residents are placed in shared rooms, then it's important to implement strategies to minimize transmission between the roommates. Some of these strategies could be maintaining spatial separation of at least three feet between beds to reduce the opportunity for inadvertent sharing of items use of privacy curtains to limit direct contact, cleaning and disinfecting any shared equipment, cleaning and disinfecting the environmental surfaces on a more frequent schedule, changing personal protective equipment and performing hand hygiene when switching care from one roommate to another. If there are multiple residents in your facility with a novel or targeted MDRO, you may want to consider cohorting them together in one wing or unit. That decreases the direct movement of healthcare workers from colonized and infective residents to those who are not colonized. What do I, as the infection preventionist, need to know about the contracted staff in my facility? And this is a question that we receive fairly often. One of the things you need to remember with your contracted staff and to ask the agency is what type of infection prevention training and education have they received? And ask to see that training to make sure it aligns with your facility's training requirements. And you also want to think about an employee health standpoint and have the contracted staff receive the necessary vaccinations and screenings that are required by your facility. Do contracted staff follow facility policies or their own policies? Contracted staff should follow the policies and procedures of your facility. If they have their own policies, such as lab personnel, do those policies align with your facility policies? And then you must also monitor the staff to make sure they are following the policies and procedures of your facility. This is again the call-in numbers. Please make sure that you have these calls on your calendar so you attend them to receive the most up-to-date guidance on COVID-19. This is our contact information. Um, my contact information is on the left. Terry Lees is on the right. Please reach out to us with any questions you may have. We are both extremely proud of you and proud of everything you're doing to protect your staff and residents. Terry Lee and I are with you in this war and we are here as a resource for you. Thank you for attending. Please call in to the COVID-19 calls. 
with the phone numbers and the contact information we provided. That is the end of our webinar.